Hi friends, I am going to read chapter seven. I've already recorded eight. I'm not sure how I missed recording seven last year, but here it is. It's a short one. Um, and it's the quote is from a journal of New Hampshire, Major Henry Dearborn. I trust we have convinced the British butchers that the cowardly Yankees can, and when there is a call for it, will fight. The camp awoke before dawn, carts rattling, cook pots clanging, axes biting into wood, bold conversating voices and the drummer boys at their task announcing the day. I stood and brushed the dirt from my breeches, then wrapped my blanket around my shoulders, shivering. My head was particularly cold. A group of Oneida and Stockbridge warriors, the best scouts in the army, strode by, followed by a pack of lean riflemen in hunting shirts, likely from Virginia. I rolled my blanket and packed my sack and tried to listen in on every voice around me. General Gates had already ordered several companies out of camp to harass the British. Yesterday's victory meant nothing until all the Redcoats surrendered and became our prisoners. The thought startled me, our prisoners. When had the affairs of this army again become mine? My stomach growled, reminding me of larger concerns. I'd been fed the night before in the befuddlement that followed the battle. I'd be spotted as a scoundrel seeking a free meal if the light of, in the light of day. I walked, pondering my predicament and keeping a watchful eye out for trouble. The encampment was a huge rusticated city of tents and brush huts for the thousands who had come to fight the British. Most of the soldiers were white skinned militiamen who had enlisted with their neighbors and kin. This made it hard for a stranger like me to blend in at dinner time without being questioned. But every regiment of the Continental Army had a goodly number of black mulatto soldiers. I had a fair chance of passing myself off as a Continental at least long enough to get something to eat. I'd conversated with Agrippa, a friendly chap in Patterson's brigade, a few days earlier. He resembled me close enough to be a cousin, which amused us both, but I dared not seek him out. The Massachusetts regiments were positioned dangerously close to the wagon's driver, wagon driver's camp. The thought of being so close to Trumbull made the hair on the back of my neck prickle as if lightning were about to strike. I'd try my luck with the Connecticut troops. They had the most black soldiers of all the states in camp, plus some Narragansetts. If fortune was smiling, I'd find a company cook there in need of spectacles and eat until I was ready to burst. I made my way through the camp following the nose trails carved by the smells of roasting meat, fresh bread, and bubbling stews. The first cook I approached was not as nearsighted and he seemed as he seemed and sent me off with a wicked scolding. The second one did the same and the third threatened me with his knife when my hand brushed accidentally against a bowl of apples on his table. I dragged myself down row after row of tents and cook fires, feeling ever more out of sorts and famished. By a washing tent, I spied a young white girl with long straw colored braids carrying a baby on her hip. She paused to talk with a woman, likely their mother, who was scrubbing bloody bandages in the tub. The girl then took two pieces of bread from her trencher on the table, gave one to the babe and walked away from the tent, bouncing up and down, singing softly. The bet bread was smeared with apple butter. I wanted it. Stealing from children is wrong, I thought, worse than wrong. But the notion planted itself in my head and grew deep roots. I would wait until the girl drew farther away from the tent run past and snatch the bread out of her hands and dash away. She would not go hungry. There was more bread on the table. The mother squeezed brown water from the bandages, bandages and hung them on a line strung between two trees. The bump of her skirt showed another child was on the way and my thievish thoughts shamed me. I resolved to pay for my meal. I would drop one of Trumbull's spoons in the road as I grabbed the bread from her daughter. It would be frontier sort of purchase, not stealing. Ho oh, there, master stone thrower. The voice was loud, but I paid it little heed, worrying that if any gun-toting soldiers saw me take the bread, but I didn't um, take the bread, but did not notice my payment, they might well cause problems. Mayhaps it would be safer to trade with the washerwoman direct. I say, you there, the voice called again. I was on the verge of giving the woman a cheery hello when someone plucked at my sleeve. Master thrower of stones, the gap-toothed rebel boy from the ravine. I was beginning to think you were dead. His homespun shirt was torn at the right elbow and his face was still dirty from gunpowder and smoke, but he appeared to be in one piece, body and soul. Not dead yet, I said, but I will be soon if I don't eat. He reached into his sack. Can't let that happen. He handed me an enormous red apple. I grabbed it and took a bite. Thank you, I said, juice running down my chin. 
My name is Evan, he said, removing his hat and nodding politely. Ebenezer Woodruff of the 16th Massachusetts in your debt and at your service. The heavenly taste of apple made it impossible to lie. I wiped my face on my sleeve. My name is Curzon. Evan barely noticed. I told my uncle what you did for me yesterday, what you did for the whole family, because Woodruffs, we set a quite, we set quite a store by family. And my uncle said, you go out there and find that lad. We need to thank him proper and make sure he's come no harm. I took a second large bite and chewed, uncertain about what I ought to say. Are you headed on duty? Out on duty, he asked. Two more quick bites and a swallow. The taste compelled me to further honesty. I'm not a soldier. What are you then? I'm on my own and looking for work. His face brightened. You could enlist. We lost a few fellows yesterday. Captain needs replacements. I shook my head. I served once. That was enough. The war is almost over, he said. Wouldn't be for too long. I ate the core and shook my head. I can't change your mind, he asked. Wolves couldn't change my mind. Evan sighed. More's the pity. Come along for a meal, at least. Uncle will be bad if I let you walk away hungry. You can get me more food. He punched my shoulder so hard my fingers went numb. Eating is the best part of soldiering. All right, that's chapter seven. I will post already recorded chapter eight, and I look forward to discussing these two chapters with you. Thanks.